Hey, guys. Um, well, it's been extraordinary, hasn't it? I mean, what an amazing few days. Uh, I honestly had no idea what to expect, none at all. Uh, I was with my family on a vacation and kind of flew to LA and got on a plane, and here we were. Um, but it's been amazing, and all of you are brilliant. Uh, I've been so inspired. I, uh, I recently gave up coffee, and I've never seen more tea in my life. I've been drinking tea all over and over and over again, and now my hands are shaking a little bit. Uh, I feel like it's like so quintessentially, stereotypically British, right? It's like my first time in this country, and I'm just downing tea. Um, <laughs> But I've been, I've been watching all the speakers, you know, and the whole time kind of knowing that at the end of it I'd be last. And so just being inspired by the speakers and kind of wanting to copy them, you know, kind of imitating different styles. And, you know, Tim, like I really loved the rant. And, and so after Tim, I went out and I started writing and I was like, maybe I'll just do a rant. Like, that'd be great. You know, I'll just pace up and down the stage, like ripping my hair out. And, um, and, and I started thinking, like, well, uh, maybe it's just not as good if you're not an old, bald British man, you know? Like, um, and I, 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 thought about, um, I thought about having everybody stand up and sing a song. Um, thanks, John, uh, <laughs> asshole. Um, <laughs> uh, but then um, I think I kept going back to, to Jesse's quote, uh, who said, Jesse, well, where are you? Are you there? What, what was the quote? Um, I wrote it on my hand, but it got wiped off. I think he said, um, in the particular lies the universal. Um, that's, I'm an idiot. Wow, James. Um, in the particular lies the universal. Um, that really sort of our, our greatest thing that we can do is share how we got here and where we're going from here. Um, tell our story very, very well. And in the process, perhaps, we all learn a little bit more about our own story um, and where we can go from here. So I thought I would just do that. Um, my story really begins in San Diego. Uh, I am... I grew up right on the border, and you know, border towns are interesting, right? Border towns are a little bit odd. They, they, you're sort of going back and forth, back and forth, and you're like seeing this thing that we call a nation state, right? This like idea of, 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 of borders, right? Sort of visually over and over and over again, and especially with something like America and Mexico, you're sort of seeing inequity in, in its like most visual form on a regular basis, and trying to process those things as a young child and asking questions that um, no one had, you know, there are really no great answers for, right? Um, and, and, and in second grade, my dad was kind of this, this like young, energetic, visionary guy, and he saw a lot of things ahead. He saw obesity and, and diabetes and like a lot of different things that would be hurting our, our, our world and, and specifically our country. And so what he thought was the best thing that we needed was we needed really healthy food and mass distribution. Um, and so what he did was he, he was a bit of a hippie, and so he set up the first industrial quinoa farms uh, in the world. And so he was going to bring quinoa to the world. And so this was his dream And when I was a young boy. And, and so he was out on the farms and out meeting with investors. And he had his partner named Dick, this, this guy who was his, his business partner who babysat for me. And, um, and, and, and they raised $8 million to get these industrial farms together. Uh, and, and we were just like so proud of my dad. And, and then one day, uh, it turned out that Dick was a con artist. Um, and the money was gone. And, 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 so, and so, you know. At a larger level, right, it took decades for the quinoa industry to really rebuild, right? But at a smaller level, my family just didn't have anything. We were just broke, like at zero, right? So what do you do? And so we, we, I remember I was in second grade, and we're sitting together around the table as a family, and my mom and my dad are there, and they're just, you know, stressed, and my grandma and my grandpa are there, and my grandpa was a bit of a hustler. Uh, he had, like, made his way, you know, like, um, just all sorts of weird ideas. He had done taco stands and just whatever it took to survive. And, and, and so we're all panicked, and, and my grandpa kind of snickers a little bit, and he stands up, and he turns off the light, and he pulls off this, um, this like, gray tube. Uh, and he pulls out of the gray tube this plastic string. And, and, you know, I'm in second grade, so I'm, like, you know, bewildered by my grandfather, right, completely mesmerized. And he, and he takes the plastic tube, and he cracks it. And all of a sudden, it's glowing. It's a glow-in-the-dark necklace. And I'd never seen anything like it before. It was sort of like, oh, amazing, right? Like, this is like magic. Like, my grandfather's a sorcerer. And, and, 
And, and he was like, this is what's going to get us out. And so that night, we all got our tubes, and we put ropes on them like Robin Hood, you know, like they were our sheath. And, uh, and, and we all put fanny packs on, which were really cool in like, you know, 1987. Super dope. Mine was neon. Uh, and, and, and we went out to the carnival that night, and we start selling glow-in-the-dark necklaces. And I was so nervous, you know, and they were nervous to bring me too. Like, what's the kid going to do? Um, but then all of a sudden, what I realized is that I was really small. And, and I could get through any crowd, right? So they're in the back while everybody's looking at something. And I'm like, right? Like up into the front where all the other little kids are. And especially the little girls, uh, which is great. Like, um, because they like pretty things and I like them. And, uh, and, so, and, so we, and so we went back that night and everybody's got their fanny packs, you know, and we're pulling money, like these fistfuls of money out of our fanny packs. And I had outsold my family by like five times, right? Like I'm just pulling out 20s and just fistfuls of money. We put it in the middle of the table and it was sort of like, this is how we're going to get through. This is how we're going to survive as a family. And so we do this, you know, this is my childhood, you know, at night we would go out and we do this and this is how we paid for summer camp and Christmas and field trips and, you know, we made our way until my dad found, my dad found his footing again. And I don't think I realized for, you know, decades uh, how deeply that would affect me. Um, I, uh, my first job outside of college, um, I, I quit it and, and decided, you know, I was kind of done working. Um, I wasn't really into that thing, like the routine thing. It didn't really suit me. And so I packed my bags and I hightailed out to Africa. I was 26 years old. Um, and I show this picture, um, which, is, which is day one. Uh, yeah, um, mostly because I think what this picture says is like cocky little shit. Uh, you know, no idea what I'm doing, why I'm there, just want to change the world. Hoorah, you know, just... Uh, um, but there's this, there's this great quote by Herman Melville uh, that says, you know, it is not down on any map. True places never are. And so that was the idea. I wanted to find true places, true people. Hear sounds I never heard before, smell smells I never smelled before, and just go. Um, and so I did. Um, I got lost. And I don't know if you guys can see that, but uh, I got lost. I uh, got lost. Just kept getting lost, as lost as I could possibly get. Um, this is a moonlight dance with, you know, 4,000 people at 4 in the morning. Dust so thick it clogs your lungs, but you dance anyway. Um, just kept getting lost, kept getting lost until the end of it ended up in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the original idea with Congo, you know, it was just part of the trip. It was like we were going to go in for five days, learn all we could, and then get out. Uh, we're just exploring, right? Um, we went in and we found signs of destruction everywhere. This is a van that had been exploded by a rock propelled grenade. And on the fifth day, we found this military encampment that was um, beating former child soldiers, just treating them as enemies of the state. And you guys have heard stories of child soldiers, right? This is nothing new. Uh, these boys have been abducted, forced to kill, forced to force others to kill. Uh, but these five boys were among the clever ones. You know, they were the smart ones. And they had escaped the rebel army, and they had run to the national army for refuge. And the national army was then beating them for war crimes, for crimes that they'd been forced to commit. Um, you know, we freaked out. We'd just never seen anything like that before, right? Sort of calling everybody you know, like, you gotta get these kids pulled out, you gotta get these kids pulled out, you gotta get these kids pulled out. But no return on phone calls because we were just kids, right? We didn't have press passes or credentials or experience or really any business being there at all. Um, and so because no one would return our phone calls, we spent the next eight hours just swapping stories and storytelling. You know, we've been doing it these last three days. This sort of uh, extraordinarily old and universal and connecting thing that we do. You know, you're sitting there sharing stories, and let's be honest, I mean, we lived very, very different lives. Uh, you know, I went to, I grew up in San Diego, went to university in Austin, Texas, worked for a billionaire for a bit, was traveling the continent because I wanted to, right? You know, they had grown up in the jungle, had been abducted at eight, forced to kill at 10, at 11, they're being beaten for those crimes. We had lived these very, very different lives. But you're sitting there sharing stories, and it's sort of like, uh, you know, I mean, we feel hunger the same way, right? I mean, we feel thirst the same way. Uh, we laugh at the same jokes, although there's like a 30-second delay because of the translator. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, we missed our families the same way. I'd been away from mine for three or four months. They'd been away from theirs for three or four years. You know, the differences were real, for sure, just like the differences between any of us, right? Um, but the commonalities were overwhelming. 
It was these boys who told us that the kids who were too small to carry a gun, that they had been sent to the front lines of war armed with only a whistle, that they'd been sent out as human shields. And the idea was that it would be late at night and they would go out to the front lines and blow the whistle. And you know, there were other forms of making noise, right? Pots and pans and yelling. They would blow the whistle and they would um, make all this noise to try and scare the enemy. And then failing that, they were supposed to receive the bullets with their bodies and in falling, create a blockade for other soldiers to hide behind. Uh, And one of the boys' shirts said extinct forever. It was a bed, bath, and body campaign uh, about exfoliation. It seemed very fitting given what had happened to his childhood. Um, you know, we ended up exposing the encampment to the UN. Kids get pulled out. It was this sort of like crazy, absurd, mad day. And, and I went home that night, and this was the scene, and just like, you know those nights when you just rage, you know, just like drinking wine and punching holes through walls and just screaming at the moon and just raging and laying it all out onto a page, just wrote this stupid little blog called Falling Whistles. Sent it out to like 80 friends and family. It was my mom, my dad, my grandma, my brother, my best buddies. Uh, and they just forwarded it around the world. I forwarded it and forwarded it and forwarded it, and I woke up the next day to hundreds, and then the next day to thousands of emails saying, what do we do? How do we help? Why is this happening? What's going on? And it was sort of like, <laughs> like I have no idea. Uh, I just got here, right? <laughs> um, and we just decided to figure it out. Um, made fake press passes, uh, saddled up, and we went out. Um, we went out. And we went out, and we went out. And what we found was a gorgeous country, as beautiful as anywhere I've ever seen in my life. I mean, the second largest rainforest in the world, right? 100-foot canopies that stretch on as far as you can see. Women who wore the most incredible colors, oranges and blues and purples and yellows. Men who were meticulous with their fashion. They, they might live in a mud hut and have to walk miles across a mud field to get to the meeting. By the time they get to that meeting, they will have pulled the toothbrush out of their belt and polished their shoes till it was at a perfect shine and made sure their tie knot was perfectly straight. All right, a people who had been beaten down by decades of war but who carried themselves with tremendous dignity. This is the Wally Collie Rainforest, the deepest red zone in the world, which is the highest rate of death. And just gorgeous. And war. So much war. Um, went deep in the rebel base camps asking, why is this happening? What's going on? Who's funding you? Who's behind this? What's it going to take to stop it? Um, note to self, don't smile when hanging out with child soldiers. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I was just nervous. Never done this before. Um, this boy was 19, he was abducted when he was young. You can see there's not a trace of a child left. Uh, this man on my left is a man named Major Lexi. Major Lexi was 21, studying poetry and philosophy at university. Uh, in this photo, he's 29. In that time, he's done horrific things, right? He's raped women and burned villages, taken children, tortured people. When you sit down and have a coffee with him, he still seems a whole lot like that 21-year-old, right? Um, the deeper we dug, the more we saw humanity and even the most vile of creatures. This boy had been beaten up and uh, tied, these are from the ropes, by a man named General Nkunda. We asked this boy to draw what he had seen. He drew a tree on fire and a gun with blood coming out of it. Um, this is Nkunda, who I met a couple days after meeting these boys, and you're shaking his hand and you're looking into his eyes, and you want so badly to be Rambo. You know what I mean? Like you just want to just grab those guns. and. And yet also you sit and we spent six hours together and it's sort of like, you know, he has a family, he has children, uh, he's leading what he believes is an army of justice. What is this, right? What's going on? Like, what's behind this? And why have I never heard of it before? We found war. So much war. The UN spends over a billion dollars a year, right? 17,000 peacekeeping troops. 
And what we found was that this was not a war of ideology. This is not a war of religion or any of these things. This is a war about money. That's it. That's what this game is. This is a more about resources. It's about minerals that end up in our electronic products. And this is what's going on. You've got $27 trillion in natural resources here, the richest place in the world, and also the deadliest place in the world. And these two things were not unrelated. And what we found as well was that this was not a new problem, right? This goes back all the way. I mean, when the bicycle was in invented, we needed rubber. And where was there more rubber than anywhere else? Congo. And then the automobile, and we needed more rubber. And then in 20 years, 10 million people were killed. It was half the country for rubber. And that this problem had gone on and on and on. And by the end of it, I was just ready to get the hell out of Dodge. This is my first day home, surrounded by friends and family, mimosa to my left. <laughs> what do you do? Right? Like, what do you do? Really, I mean, I had no idea what to do, so I just started screaming at people. And I would write. I mean, I would write, and I would write, and I would write, and I would write, and I would write until my hands were, I just didn't know what to do, and I'd just start yelling. Friends would throw parties to welcome me home, and I'd just start screaming, like, people are dying. This is real. I mean, you're dealing with 6.9 million people dead. What? What? That number cannot be real. 6.9 million people dead, that's 1,500 people dying every single day, and that's 1,000 women being raped every single day, and it's happening right now. Like, as we live and breathe, it's happening right now, and it's sort of like, you know, people stop inviting you back. <laughs> you know, like, who wants to hang out with that kid uh, yelling on the bar? Um, and so one of my best friends, a guy named Marcus, I was sleeping on his couch, surviving off his ramen. He was sleeping in an attic at the time. And um, he bought an old vintage whistle off eBay, gave it to me as a gift, and said, no matter where you go, keep those boys alive in your heart. It was just late at night, and he just said, no matter where you go, keep that at the forefront. And all of a sudden, I could go out, and I didn't have to scream at anybody. Because everywhere I went, people would just ask, what's the whistle? All of a sudden, I got to speak up in a way that made sense, right? I'm not the kid in front of the grocery store, like, do you care about women's rights? And it's like, yes, but I don't care about you, right? Like, um, you know, all of a sudden they're asking me. And the conversation is taking place in a way that pulls people together instead of pushes them apart. And so this was our first day in our first office, right, going to work with a bucket. Uh, and we started studying old whistleblowers. What we found was a pattern that at the beginning of all change, at the beginning of every single thing that had ever changed, from women demanding to be equal to men, right? Like blacks demanding to be equal to whites and being allowed to vote, to the kid on the playground who says, no, don't call him gay, it doesn't mean stupid. Right, at the beginning of every single change that had always begun with one person or a small group of people who had said what needed to be said. Long before they knew the answers or the solutions, right? They just said it because it had to be said that there was a pattern. And so it became our symbol, our symbol of protest as we pursued solutions in a region where they were in short supply. Uh, we started saying, make their weapon your voice, be a whistleblower for peace, and just hustling whistles out of our pockets. We had $5, we bought five crappy whistles, we sold those, we had $50, we bought more, we had $150, and uh, people started wearing them. <laughs> I love her, I just wanna, she's, she's just such a munch. Um, they wore them, and they wore them, and they wore them. And everywhere they'd go, people would ask, right? What's the whistle? It's for peace in Congo. What's happening in Congo? Biggest war in the world. What? Really? New conversation. And the Falling Whistles campaign was born, a campaign for peace in Congo. This is David Lewis. He's one of my best friends. And so when we got to $150, we wanted to reach the whole world, right? Like, hoorah. Dave hitchhiked from Austin, Texas to New York City. He hitchhiked through the south and then up along the east coast, stopping in 40 cities over the course of four months and sitting down with people just like right now and just like looking them in the eyes and saying, look, like we don't have all the answers. Actually, we have none, right? Like we don't know anything. But we know that over 6 million people have died and we're not going to be quiet until it's changed. So join us. And he built the coalition from scratch, living rooms, coffee shops. He inspired three college students who rode their bikes from Florida to California, stopping in every city saying the same thing. This kid, Marcus, slept out of his attic so he could do all of our original design work. That's what gave us a website. This kid, John, read the story on his iPhone while he was going to the bathroom, uh, packed up his bags and moved out to LA to run finances. We got desks out of dumpsters, put them in a garage, and we just went to work, right? Peace in Congo. 
whatever that means. Um, just stuffing it, filled with as many young people as we could find. Let's do this. What's this? I don't know. And we started selling the whistle with the original journal so that people would understand why we had started. And we got tools of war like a rock pelt grenade case. We put them inside of it. And we whitewashed over everything because all over Congo you see these crumbling walls that are painted white to create order out of chaos. And it was kind of like, we don't need a new paint job, right? What you need is a new wall. And it felt a lot like the way the West had whitewashed over the problems for centuries instead of, you know, getting to those root causes. Um, we went to the store down the street and we were like, we want to build a museum in your store. And they were like, a what? And we were like, a museum. We want to educate people what's happening in Congo. They were like, a what? We we're like, a museum. And they're like, I think it's called an installation. And we were like, yeah, yeah, that. Right? Like, <laughs> and so our neighbor was tearing down his fence. You know, um, the knife maker, you, you came from a community of makers. I'm in the arts district of Los Angeles, this community of makers, and so this is what happens when makers get together, right? And our friend was tearing down his fence, and we got the paint donated from Home Depot, and, and so we built the whole thing, the floor, the wall, the ceilings, and, and what happened was all of a sudden, the store had financial incentive to educate their community and advocate for peace, because the store was making money off the sale of the whistles, right? And so now, they're making money off of it, so every day, they're out educating people for us, and we're not paying them, we're making money off of it. And in three months, we educated 30,000 people about what was happening, and we were in the top five selling brands of the year. And it was sort of like, this could work, right? Like, there's a model here. And so we kept building them. We built them all over the country. We built light boxes trying to illuminate these truths that have been held in shadows. We built them everywhere, using all reclaimed wood and, and, and donated paint and just building and building and building. And we started investing in local visionaries. And I know I'm out of time, and I'm sorry. I just... Um, this woman's name is Christine, and, and she was 24 when she started working with 70 kids. And we said, well, we'll we're going to, whatever you need, we'll do it. She said, I need $3,000 a month to start working with 300 kids. And we said, done. And we had, like, no money, right? So it's like $3,000 a month we've committed. We're in. And so the business model was I was making $500 a month, and Dave was making $500 a month, and we needed $1,000 a month for the bunk beds in the garage, and then we needed $3,000 a month for, for Christine. And so $5,000 for the whistles every month, like, Go, right? Like, you're on it. Boardwalk. You're just hustling, like, out, right? Glow-in-the-dark necklaces. Like, and I didn't even realize it for years. But it's like you get to that moment and you just click into your, like, emergency mode. And we're just selling. And we're getting this money over and over and over again. And she's starting this work teaching art and music and dance and, and doing what she does. And then we met this guy named Arnold. And when we met Arnold that same day, he had found 200 kids dug into a prison in a mountain. And they were working to advocate for their release. What we found out a week later was that he had gotten their release and he had gotten them into rehabilitation. And it was sort of like, you're Harriet Tubman, man. Like, really? That's what you did today? Like, I checked my email, you know? Like, so we started working with Arnold and we funded a, a sewing center for women who had been raped by war and, and a rehabilitation center for children. And then this man, Dr. Joe, who went to Belgium to become a surgeon because there were women who were being raped and now he's doing surgeries. And he had this program built to do surgeries for about 600 kids. And, and the State Department cut the funding because of the recession and there was no one who would cover it. And so Flying Whistles was sort of like, well, we could buy a contact management system or we could fund like 600 surgeries, right? Like it's sort of like, and so we were able to fund the surgery and, and and, and uh, all of a sudden, and then this guy Blaze, who built a quinine factory, and we were able to help fund the transportation system. He got 300,000 people treated with malaria prevention in a year. Uh, while getting jobs, this woman, Justine, who's pulled together 39 women's groups from throughout the region and are throwing protests, right, demanding justice for women. And they've created the landmark cases that are putting rapists in jail and keeping them there. And they're making those stories public throughout the country so that women know they can take their rapists to trial as well. And last week, she was threatened by Nkunda's successor, a guy named Bosco, who's now called the Terminator. And she was threatened by him, and she had to escape to Holland, and that's where she is right now. We're working to get her $50,000 so that she can survive for the next couple of years in hiding. But that's what she does. And this guy, Sakombi, who when I met him, he was 26 and I was 26. And we'd walk through the streets and he got me joints because, you know, that's what you do when you're 26. Uh, but, but we'd walk through the town and, like, everywhere he went, people knew him, you know. And he was, like, kind of like the kid, you know. He's like, oh, oh, oh. And everybody loved him. He's high-fiving, you know. He's like the man in town. And so Sakombi started the fastest growing radio station in eastern Congo. And it's art and it's music and it's sex and it's politics and it's fashion and it's the whole thing. And we're, we ha we're able to use this and work with him because it's from the streets and then to the streets to do, well, I'll talk about it in a second. This man, Amani, who's amazing, his name means Peace Warrior. And we built with him the first professional hair care training school in Congo because the women love their hair that's 
so funky and crazy, but the men are the ones who make money off of it, right? So now the women are able to make money off of it. Um, He's just brilliant. And then the people who are making this happen is this guy like Mario. Mario's the, hands down, the best graphic designer I know in the world. He's just so genius. And he could be making so much money at an ad agency. But instead, he works inside our warehouse in downtown LA and he fights for peace. Right? He uses his talent to do it every day and make sure it's real to people in a way that they can understand. And Monique, who's just this like ass-kicking, ball-busting human rights lawyer who's a descendant from Holocaust survivors. And I think she's largely responsible for getting the State Department to appoint a special envoy. And she takes, like, the worst salary, right? I mean, uh, add to Chan, who studied aerospace engineering, but instead of doing that, he's making sure that we have logistics, right? And the back end is done. Uh, Eve Muya, who was a refugee and got a Fulbright scholarship, so he travels the country sharing about what he's learned. Sinclair, who was a hustler in New York, like this like party promoting, you know, full on nightlife. Like if Sinclair ran the party, you knew it was the best party. Uh, and now he organizes that, but for peace in Congo. And these are the people who make up the wheel. Um, and the wheels are symbol for holistic problem solving. It's also the shape of the organization. Um, and I would love to show you how it works, uh, but another time. Um, here's what I want to say. Um, because we are out of time. You know, last year um, we built a number of things. One of the things we built was a system with Sukombi for real-time open source election monitoring. It was Sukombi and IDEO. We put them together and we built this amazing system uh, using text messages and radio. And then, and then on election day we launched it and it was like, yes, like everybody's high-fiving, right? And uh, two hours later the Congolese government shut down SMS across the country and they started shooting people in the streets pulling people out of their homes and, and torturing them. And uh, we were able to get a couple people released, but it was just a couple among so many. And um, that among a lot of other things, and I just broke, right? Like so many people dying and, and, and feeling it deeply. Uh, and at that moment when I was walking away, right? Like it, uh, you feel the weight of lives on your shoulders. And at that moment, um, my father died. Um, uh, and, 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 and so that's why I've just been traveling, because I'm, I'm, I've been working through this. And the thing I just want to say is that life is real, you know, and it's precious, and it's so beautiful, um, and it's so short. It, and um, uh, on the, one of the days in the military encampment with the boys, we found out the two of them had been fighting for opposing rebel groups. And I asked them, does that make you enemies? Because I didn't know, you know. And um, one of them looked over at the other one, and he kissed him. And he said, we are only boys. How can we be enemies? And it was sort of like, that's the whole game right there. Um, we went back into our history, and we took the W from we the people, and we took the P from people, and we turned it into an F. And so we are falling whistles for a free world where every human being has liberty and justice. Um, I don't know what you do. I don't know what you love, but I know that for us it's not about charity. You know, it's not about pity or sadness, and if you feel those feelings, and I've not done my job, and I'm sorry. For us, it's about solidarity. It's about free men and free women, and it feels so interesting to be saying this in England, right? Um, where this idea was born, but it's about free men and free women using the thing that's most fundamental to our freedom, our speech, to fight for others so that they also can have life. So I don't know how you whistleblow. Um, I don't know what that thing is for you. But I would ask that you would use that thing because what is possible today was not possible five years ago. It's infinite. It's extraordinary. And so... Um, with us or not, live your lives, passion and conviction, forget your fears and move forward because we need you, the us's, right? The only way it's ever begun in small tents and pubs, living rooms and coffee shops. Thank you. <laughs>